Today, the subcommittee will receive testimony on fiscal year 2025 budget requests for the reserve components of the United States Armed Forces. To discuss the budget requests and other issues related to the reserve components, we welcome our panel consisting of General Daniel Hawkinson, the Chief of the National Guard Bureau, Lieutenant General Jody Daniels, the Chief of the Army Reserve, Vice Admiral John Muston, the Chief of the Navy Reserve, Lieutenant General Leonard Anderson, Commander of the Marine Corps Reserve, and Lieutenant General John Healy, the Chief of the Air Force Reserve. Welcome uh, to you all and thank you for your years of distinguished service. We're looking forward to your testimony today. The reserve components provide our nation with critical force multiplier in a time of war and indispensable national response force in times of peace. We all know that the National Guard is our nation's 911 response when it comes to natural disasters. In California, the Guard's firefighting capabilities save lives every year. But the Guard is also desperately trying to repel an invasion across our southern border. This invasion, encouraged by President Biden's failed immigration and border policies, is bringing deadly fentanyl and criminals into our communities. While most Americans are aware of the Guard's domestic responsibilities, they should also be aware of the great work the Guard is doing internationally. Working with our partners around the world through the Critical State Partnership Program, the Guard is enhancing the security of our allies. Our reserves also demonstrated their importance during periods of peacetime peril. At the height of the pandemic, our reserve forces deployed around the country to augment overwhelmed civilian medical personnel in places like New York City. So for all that you do, we salute you. But to ensure that our reserve components can continue their great work, they must be adequately resourced, especially given the dangerous global environment we find ourselves in. Unfortunately, uh, the budget uh, has uh, failed to, uh, the President's budget has failed to request the resources necessary to support our Guard and Reserve. While re inflation is running over 3%, the overall funding request for the Reserve components in fiscal year 2025 for programs under the subcommittee's jurisdiction is nearly 2% lower than fiscal year 2024. This equates to a reduction of over $1 billion. While there are some reserve components that received increases in this budget over last year, those appear to have come at the expense of other reserve components. Now, some may argue that this strategy of robbing Peter to pay Paul was made necessary as a result of the caps imposed by the Fiscal Responsibility Act. However, the President has ignored those caps when it comes to, comes to non-defense spending. One need only look at the National Guard's unfunded priority list as an example of the woeful inadequacy of the President's budget request. The fiscal year 2024 list of unfunded priorities totaled $662 million for programs under this subcommittee's jurisdiction. For fiscal year 2025, that list has grown to a whopping $2.4 billion. That's a 263% increase in unfunded priorities. While the President's budget is obviously deficit let me be clear that this committee's strong support for the Guard and Reserve is unwavering. In fact, last year we added $1 billion above the budget request for the National Guard and Reserve Equipment Account and $200 million above the budget request for the National Guard Counter Drug Program. But we need to understand your actual shortfall, so I'll be interested in hearing from each of you regarding any risk this budget is posing to mission requirements and the quality of life improvements for your personnel as well as where you would use this additional funding. Specifically, I want to hear your perspectives on how confident you are that you'll meet your required end strength in fiscal year 2025, the impact of NATO's expansion on the National Guard State Partnership Program, the challenges posed to the Air National Guard units by the F-15EX fielding timelines, and the timeline for the KC-46A bed down at March Air Reserve Base. I'll also be interested in the Guard's perspectives regarding the proposed move to, of Guard personnel into the Space Force, an issue which has generated considerable debate recently. With that, I recognize the distinguished ranking member, Ms. McCollum, for her opening statement, uh, statement and remarks. Thank well, you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to start out saying I agree with all your remarks, but I have to take just a slight um, a moment to talk about my disagreement with your remarks about what is happening at our southern border. We do need to bring order to the border, but to lay it all on the blame of the president, uh, the current president of the United States, I think shortchanges the reality of how Congress has failed. We have failed 
to produce any meaningful legislation to reform our broken immigration system. But Mr. Chair, I couldn't agree with you more on the rest of your statement about how we need to make sure that the Reserve and the Guard uh, has the equipment, the training to fulfill its mission and to return home safely when called upon. I want to welcome each of you before the committee today and a very special warm Minnesota welcome to Lieutenant uh, General Anderson. Um, uh, General uh, Anderson, it is 47 degrees in Duluth and 48 in Minnesota. So welcome to steamy DC and your first appearance before the committee. Our sincere thanks to General Hawkinson and, uh, and Lieutenant General Daniels and Vice Admiral Munson for what may be your last appearances before the committee. So we got the new kid on the block, so take lots of notes, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Anderson. Uh, each and every one of you have dedicated your life to service and know how indebted we all feel to you. And on behalf of the people I represent in the 4th District, thank you. Um, each of your components are a vital part to our national security. Each of you has personally deployed into areas of conflict, assisting your active component counterparts in a seamless manner. Thank you for the work that you do in leading our Guard and Reserve personnel. Today, I'm particularly interested to hear how the administration's fiscal year 2025 request will enhance your ability to meet your mission's goals and if any uh, capability gaps exist, as the chair pointed out. Our National Guard and Reserve components are called upon to support a variety of missions, including humanitarian missions, the continued support to the southwest border, overseas operations, and for the Guard in particular, the state partnership program activities, which this committee dearly um, is invested in. It would be helpful to receive an update on the pace of deployments affecting your troops morale, readiness, and retention efforts. It would be helpful for each of you to share how your budget request will impact the current pace of operations for each of your services. Serving your country on top of managing a civilian job, and in many cases, supporting a big, busy family, is one of the highest forms of service. We thank you, and we thank everyone who serves alongside and under you. You are truly putting country above self, Thank you for all your efforts, and I look forward to a productive di dialogue today. I thank you for the courtesy, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Hawkinson, please take three minutes for your opening remarks. Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, and esteemed members of the subcommittee, as mentioned, this is my final testimony before you as the 29th Chief of the National Guard Bureau. It's been the honor of my life for Kelly and I and all of Team 29 to represent the soldiers, airmen, and families of the National Guard. I'm tremendously proud of their service and sacrifices, and I'm grateful for this subcommittee's support. Thanks to you, we continue to increase the combat readiness of our formations and improve the quality of life of our soldiers, airmen, and their families. Our nation's investment in the National Guard comes at a pivotal moment. Our strategic competitors are seeking advantages in every domain, land, sea, air, space, and cyber. If we are to compete and deter successfully, and if necessary, prevail in combat, we must invest in our people. Our soldiers and airmen, with the support of their families, are the ones who carry out these missions. They stand watch in the turbulent corners of the world. They monitor our airspace. They train with our allies and partners. They respond to our communities in time of need. It is our people who make the difference. They make us lethal, resilient, and responsive. Our people, like our pilots, maintainers, and support personnel and our Air Guard fighter squadrons are experienced, capable, and provide the capacity we need to keep pace with global demands, deter our adversaries, and if necessary, prevail in combat. With significant fighter pilot and maintainer shortages in the Air Force, we believe through temporary cross-component aircraft transfers, we can retain the critical fighter capability in all 25 of our existing fighter squadrons until aircraft procurement efforts can replenish them. Our people, like our full-time support personnel, build readiness in our formations and are increasingly challenged to meet the growing requirements. The cap on active guard and reserve positions and a federal technician program that is no longer competitive must be addressed to ensure we have the full-time manning necessary to meet our service-directed readiness requirements. Our people, as in every member of our force, continues to grapple with complex duty statuses and benefits disparity, 
which is why we need duty status reform. Lastly, our people include our National Guard space units that have nearly three decades of expertise and experience. We must find a way forward for these highly trained professionals as space becomes an even greater warfighting domain. These are issues that affect our people, the heart of our force. They are integral to recruiting and retention and ultimately our ability to fight and win. As my time comes to a close, I will ensure a seamless transition to the next National Guard leadership team and continue to position the Joint Force for success. With your help, we will keep our promise to America to be always ready, always there. Thank you for your time, your friendship, and your support. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. Uh, next, uh, Lieutenant General Daniels, please take three minutes for your opening remarks. Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify once again this morning. On behalf of Command Sergeant Major Lombardo and the 190,000 soldiers and civilians of the Army Reserve, we stand ready to protect American interests and posture ourselves to meet challenges at home and around the globe. On any given day, nearly 9,000 reserve soldiers are mobilized or deployed worldwide in support of combatant commands, while tens of thousands more are encouraged, are engaged in training events and annual combined and joint exercises. They reinforce alliances and partnerships around the globe. The Army Reserve is also a key partner in the homeland, facilitating large-scale mobilization operations and supporting First Army in the activation of more than 12,000 soldiers and civilians every year. As the Joint Force prepares to operate in a contested logistics environment, the Army Reserve will play a key role in delivering the critical enabling capabilities needed for large-scale op combat operations. A ready and modernized Army Reserve is a crucial part of a Joint Force that can deploy, fight, and win our nation's wars. From the start of my tenure, I challenged our leaders to prioritize tough, realistic training done safely, well over administrative metrics. That message is resonating throughout the force, and Innovative Readiness Training, or IRT, is a textbook example of this. In 2023, more than 1,500 Army Reserve soldiers participated in 16 IRT missions across 12 states and three U.S. territories, providing key services to almost 40,000 patients. The Army is undergoing a once-in-a-generation transformation. The Army Reserve requires robust investment to modernize our aging equipment to enable interoperability with the Joint Force. Nagria represents roughly 30 to 40 percent of the Army Reserve's equipment procurement budget. That said, the Army Reserve's unfunded equipment requirements list continues to grow. With inflation and material costs rising, our buying power is no longer the same. The success of the Army Reserve's modernization efforts hinges on Nagria funding, and we greatly appreciate the committee's continued support. Additionally, about half of our 18,000 Humvees are beyond their useful life, reducing our ability to respond to crises and risking soldier safety without upgraded anti-lock brake systems and electronic stability control kits. Your support to these modernization programs will build readiness and enhance safety for decades to come. Despite the most challenging recruiting environment in decades, the Army Reserve's end strength has remained above the fiscal year 24 and 25 strength objectives. I would ask that this committee support Reserve Personnel Army, the RPA account, funding reflective of our current end strength to maintain our momentum and to continue to train, fight, and accomplish our mission. Caring for our soldiers and families and ensuring they receive the benefits they deserve is vital. Last October, the Army Reserve developed a first-of-a-kind intergovernmental support agreement pilot to deliver child care services to soldiers during weekend training. We still need assistance with uh, gaining additional weekend child care providers. Once again, I'd like to thank the committee for your support throughout my tenure. Thanks to con Congress's support, our soldiers are equipped and ready to face any conflict in the domain. Command Sergeant Major Lombardo and I are ready for your questions. Thank you, General. Uh, Vice Admiral Mustin, please take uh, three minutes for your opening remarks. Good morning, Chair Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. It's a privilege to report to you today on the status and the vision of America's Navy Reserve. I'd like to begin by recognizing my wife, Kim, whose steadfast support for 31 years exemplifies the unsung sacrifices typical of our military spouses. I'd also like to thank Master Chief Tracy Hunt for his tireless efforts in support of our enlisted reserve sailors, as well as express my thanks and appreciation to Lieutenant General Jody Daniels as we bid her fair winds and following seas. And given this will be my last hearing before this committee, I want to thank General Hokinson and my peer reserve chiefs for their support and friendship during my tenure as Chief of Navy Reserve. On any given day, the Navy Reserve provides 100,000 sailors 
three dozen ship, wing, and squadron commanding officers, nearly 150 aircraft, two SEAL teams, three expeditionary medical facilities, 2,200 strategic sea lift officers, 450 civilians, and nearly half of the Navy's Expeditionary Combat Command and intelligence capability. 24-7, 365, your Navy Reserve is standing at the ready with nearly 15,000 sailors serving on active duty orders every single day. For more than a century, your Navy Reserve has reliably responded when and where needed. Today, our current operations extend around the world. You'll find our sailors supporting operations throughout Europe, in the Indo-Pacific region, in the Red Sea, and even locally, including recent support operations in Baltimore all showcasing the flexibility, readiness, and value our citizen sailors generate and contribute to our national security. And yet these contributions merely hint at the demands required of our force in a great power conflict. We have 977 days until 2027, and the accelerating pace of that countdown clock drives our actions with a committed sense of urgency. During my tenure, the Navy Reserve has aggressively executed a multi-year transformation, focused unambiguously and unapologetically on warfighting readiness to prepare the force for high-end multi-domain warfare. This effort required the modernization of equipment, training systems, and mobilization processes to ensure our sailors are trained, available, and combat ready from day one. The procurement of modern KC-130 Juliet aircraft is the Navy Reserve's number one equipment priority. This modernization to replace aging legacy airframes is essential to ensuring the Navy Reserve can effectively and efficiently meet the contested logistics requirements and operations demanded by our combatant and fleet commanders, particularly in the Indo-Pacific area of responsibility, where this reserve-only capability factors heavily into our operations plans. We share a strong bipartisan alignment on this priority for which I am grateful and thankful. Beyond equipment, we're embracing technological advancements to improve work and training environments, harnessing our greatest asset, the minds, talents, and ideas of our reserve sailors, and propelling the Navy Reserve into a new era of operational and digital readiness and efficiency. Commitment to our sailors is central to our Navy's enduring warfighting advantage, so we've amplified the personal and professional development of every sailor and instilled a culture of excellence so every sailor, civilian, and their families can thrive. I extend my gratitude for the committee's support, which is crucial to maintaining the operational predictability essential for our sailors, their family, and our global combat readiness. Chair Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, and members of this committee, the dedication of our citizen sailors, civilians, and their supportive families is a gratifying source of daily inspiration. Commanding, representing, and advocating for the Navy Reserve has been the honor of a lifetime. Thank you for your continued support and for the opportunity to address you today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, Lieutenant General Anderson, please take three minutes for your opening remarks. Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and testify on behalf of the Commandant of the Marine Corps about your Marine Forces Reserve. I'm honored to appear uh, before you with my fellow Reserve Component Service Chiefs and with my senior enlisted leaders, Sergeant Major Edwin Moda and Command Master Chief Michael Musset. The Marine Corps Reserve has always been a critical component of the Marine Corps Total Force. The emergent picture of the intricate and multi-domain warfighting environments of the future increasingly reveals the risk of relying on the active component alone. The problem set demonstrates why the Marine Corps strategically lever leverages its reserve component in two important ways. First, the Marine Corps Reserve provides support to global force management, employed as a vital contributor to meet combatant command requirements. The reserve component, in close partnership with Marine Forces Command and 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force, continues to mature the utilization of service-retained forces in support of global crisis response operations. We provide reserve forces for global deployments that span the spectrum of conflict, and we participate in combat-related training exercises in every geographic combatant command and cybercom. Second, the Marine Corps Reserve is amplifying its talent management efforts. This subcommittee has been briefed extensively in recent years on the Marine Corps' force design initiative. Talent management is a major focus for the Marine Corps and the Marine Corps Reserve. We are identifying select individuals with high demand, low density skill sets that are inherently challenging to acquire and providing those Marines pathways to continued military service that are complementary with their civilian careers. Each year, this subcommittee provides National Guard Reserve equipment appropriation funding for the Marine Corps Reserve. And I'm grateful for your continued support through NAGRIA. The Marine Corps Reserve is designed to be equipped at near parity with the active component and NAGRIA funds allow the Marine Corps Reserve to resource the requirements set forth by Congress and the combatant commanders. The Marine Corps Reserve would realize an even greater advantage by receiving the degree of funding that restores its historical share. I ask that you consider this in your future funding decisions. The Commandant of the Marine Corps recently called the Marine Corps Reserve our backbone and emphasized to our senior leaders the need to maximize the potential of our Marine Corps Reserve forces 
by resourcing and equipping them to ensure they are prepared to meet the threats that face this nation. Reserve Marines serve honorably while balancing their civilian careers and families. They bring a breadth and depth of knowledge to the Marine Corps that gives the total force an asymmetric advantage. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, next, uh, Lieutenant General Healy, please take three minutes for your remarks. Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the 69,600 men and women of the Air Force Reserve, it's an honor for me to be here today with my senior enlisted leader, Chief Master Sergeant Israel Nunez. As a commander, I'm continually amazed at the accomplishments of our reserve airmen as they meet every challenge they're given on behalf of the nation. The Air Force Reserve provides the nation with operational capability, strategic depth, and surge capacity across every Air Force Corps mission set, both overseas and here at home. As part of a part-time component, as largely part-time component, we provide a ready-now accessible force that is both mission effective and cost efficient. As our near-peer threat increases, we are committed to the operational imperatives and the reoptimization efforts within the Department of the Air Force. Since October 7th, Air Force Reserve personnel and aircraft have mobilized to fill critical airlift and air refueling missions in support of U.S. Central Command and U.S. Transportation Command, some with only 72 hours notice. To date, in FY24, Reserve Airmen have accomplished over 68,000 man days supporting Levant operations, filling critical requirements amidst continued 24-7 operations. Reservists provided experience support to NATO allies and European partners, performing everything from intelligence analysis and cybersecurity, to airlift and air superiority missions, to aircraft maintenance and force protection. The U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Space Force would not be able to support Levant operations without Reserve Airmen. To opti optimize our performance as the total force, the Air Force Reserve must transform for the future. This transformation requires the Air Force Reserve be proportionally modernized and concurrently fielded with regular component equipment. Maintaining equipment parity with the regular component ensures our ability to match a pacing threat. Legacy aircraft divestment without recapitalization and delayed modernization adds substantial risk to sustaining combat credible air superiority and surge capacity in the future. We're grateful for Congress, for the National Guard and Reserve Equipment Appropriation, and GRI enables us to modernize or replace obsolete equipment when recapitalization by the active component is not feasible. During the past year, INGREA funding enabled installations, uh, installation of the most advanced radars, secure communication equipment, and self-protection systems, all designed to make our aircraft more lethal and more survivable in a contested environment. Our most important weapon system is and always has been our airmen. We're focused on ensuring that reserve airmen and their families receive the support they need. Two of our most significant lines of effort focus on providing accessible, affordable health care for our members, or child care for our members, as well as making health care more accessible for family members with special needs through the Exceptional Family Member Program. Over the past seven decades, the Air Force Reserve has provided combat-proven readiness. I'm certain that the Air Force Reserve will pre be prepared to defend the great nation now and in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and continued support of the Air Force Reserve, our citizen airmen and their families, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, I want to make sure that each member has a chance to ask questions, so each member will have five minutes for their questions and answers. When your time returns yellow, you have one minute remaining. First, I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Um, fentanyl. We're going to hear a lot about that, I'm sure, from all of you, but uh, we certainly hear about it all over the country. Uh, Fiscal Year 2024 Appropriations Act provides $300 million for the National Guard Counter Drug Program, which is $200 million above the President's budget request. Uh, General uh, Holkinson, how can the National Guard best utilize these resources to address the fentanyl crisis, which has claimed the lives of more than 100,000 Americans just over the last year? Chairman, uh, first of all, thank you for the additional funding uh, specific to our counter drug programs. Um, as you're aware, in every one of our states, our National Guard works closely with local law enforcement to provide additional support and capabilities um, that exceed what the state has. Not only that, we have counter drug schools, five of them throughout the country. We will utilize this funding as best we can within the authorities we're given to help support local law enforcement and address uh, this, this serious issue that we're facing. Can we get more uh, specific on that? Obviously, um, 
intelligence uh, data we've seen shows that the Chinese have been working with the two major cartels and getting the base chemicals into Mexico primarily to make the fentanyl and then the fentanyl is distributed and then apparently the these Chinese uh, criminals are working with the cartels to launder the money. Is there anything you're doing on that end to uh, use uh, some of your personnel to support activities that would track Chairman. this money? So, Chairman, obviously the stuff that's coming up from our southern borders monitored very closely by U.S. Northern Command that has that responsibility. Uh, we are in close coordination through them, through Joint Task Force North, to identify and also work with the local border states to help mitigate that wherever we can. However, with our counter drugs specifically, we're just working within the states to provide additional personnel, in some cases aircraft as well, to, for surveillance. Um, but we do have to follow the authorities when it comes to intelligence gathering and sharing that information. Well, I would hope that we're all working with those various agencies as a team effort. I understand between the fentanyl, the opioid traffic, and that includes methamphetamine, cocaine, crack cocaine, all the rest of it, plus the human trafficking side of it, plus the, the illegal farming, illegal logging operations. The FBI told me it's about $100 billion a year in activity that's controlled by the two major cartels. $100 billion a year. Uh, and it's killing over 100,000 U.S. citizens a year. And I, I can't emphasize uh, the importance of us uh, focusing on this problem. That's more deaths than's happening in all the combatant combined, uh, commands combined. It's happening uh, on, along our southern border uh, with this fentanyl crisis. So I would appreciate uh, anything that can be done to uh, facilitate that. Uh, with that, uh, uh, is Dutch here? Yeah, Dutch, uh, you recognize. Oh, excuse me, uh, Ranking Member McCall. Sorry. Well, do you have some place you need to be, Mr. Wilsonberger? No, I'm just here to support you, whatever you want to do. <laughs> That's why we're matching in blue today. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, I think we'll probably have a round possibly for another uh, – Section of questions. So I want to go to something both the chair and I um, have grave concerns about, and that is the Air Force Reservists and Space Force transition. Uh, General Healy, in your testimony, you said about 200 Air Force Reserve space uh, operators and professionals that are currently conducting space operation functions as per Space Force Personnel Management Act. This will give the airmen the, uh, um, the option to transition into Space Force under their unique personal structure. Uh, I'd like to, you to talk a little bit more about how you see this uh, going forward and what percentage you expect to uh, transform into uh, Space Force. Um, but what I do have a concern about is the decision that has been uh, starting to take place to just move uh, uh, Air Guard around uh, into um, other other positions within in Space Force. And I have with me, and you know, Mr. Chair, I've never done this before. Do we put things into the record here? I do have a letter. Be happy to submit that for the record. The national governors. And I just want to, I'm speaking as a former state representative as well as a member of Congress. States put significant amounts of money into National Guard whether it's tuition reimbursement, whether it's into, you know, equipment, land, and other things like that. So the states not only have a role in having a National Guard to uh, be there in times of disaster to make sure that we do our bit to, uh, uh, as, as a state, make sure that they're trained and prepared to serve uh, when called upon, uh, as they have been, uh, especially we see Iraq and Afghanistan, the heightened number of, of reservists and National Guard that were called out. But I'm going to just read uh, something um, from here from, from the governor's letter. Uh, the legislation that's proposed, the legislation that sidesteps, eliminates, otherwise reduces the governor's authority within their states and territories and undermines a longstanding partnership um, a presence, military readiness, and governor, uh, operational efficiencies. This action also negatively 
in, uh, negatively affects the important relationship between the governors and the DOD at a time when we need to have the full trust and confidence between these two um, to meet the growing threats possessed in the area of strategic competition as well as natural disasters. Um, can you can you tell me um, if has there's been a response back to the governors when when we were going to uh, how you see in the future um, a dialogue between Congress and between the states on this because this is a fundamental change as to how the guard works and uh, with that I'll. I'll yield for time back, and Mr. Chair, if there's something I missed in the question. Maybe, I, to maybe the I could add to that just to emphasize this. Obviously, 48 of the 50 governors signed this letter, and all the territories signed the letter. And one of the concerns that I, I, I think the ranking member and I both share is, is that once the precedent is set, that the uh, movement of guard personnel to the regular force, for whatever reason, that can, can continue. And I, I would like to add that to the general lady's question. Do you agree with that? This is setting a precedent that, that has never happened before, and this could uh, erode over time the, uh, the guard. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member McCollum, um, obviously this is a new precedent. Obviously the fact that I did see the letter yesterday had 53 governors that had signed it, um, obviously expressing a concern that it, it changes 100 years of precedent. It also ignores the, um, the non-federalized role of the Air National Guard, um, the role that they have in their states, which is very significant for all of our formations to include our space formations as well. Um, as a result, I think you're seeing a, a big concern coming from all the governors as well as all the state adjutants general about the potential precedent that this could set. Well, I, I would just add, <clears throat> we see the Navy and the Marine Corps sitting next to each other. In, in, a res, in a reservist sense. Um, and there's, and you know, the Space Force, in my opinion, was hastily put together. I'm not, I'm not opposed to the fact that we have a Space Force, but Congress, in my opinion, did not give all the due diligence as to how this was gonna be organized, what it looked like in the future, including, including what uh, a reserve and a, and a guard component would look like in the future. Um, now is the time for Congress, working with, with the governors to weigh in and so uh, I appreciate your, your answer. Uh, and uh, just, I think we're gonna have the same discussion I'm going to, I'm sure you are with the Secretary of the Air Force later on this afternoon. This is, this is, not, this is not gone unnoticed and it will not be done. You're not doing anything wrong by, by, by moving forward with this. I just don't think it was as well thought off as it, as it could have been. Uh, be, before I yield, I just, I just failed to mention this in my opening remarks. When the National Guard deploys, they deploy together as units. And I want to recognize the number of deployments I've been to over the years where there's been one or two reservists who have been part of that deployment. And um, sometimes, um, I know our Minnesota National Guards, when we're deploying, we embrace them, we welcome them in but uh, it can be um, overlooked sometimes how when reservists deploy, they deploy and they don't deploy as a full unit until, until they're I'm probably using an army term mustered together. Um, but I just want the reservists to know how much um, they're appreciated and it doesn't go unnoticed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And it's been my experience uh, here uh, to get 48 governors to sign anything is uh, remarkable in itself including all the territories. Uh, so I, my recommendation to the Air Force, uh, I think they need to work with the states in a reasonable way ahead because uh, obviously this is not gonna fly with, uh, I think, uh, nationally. With that, uh, Mr. Rogers, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, gentlemen, to the committee. Uh, there's been uh, a long-standing effort to uh, secure Gray Eagle reconnaissance drones for the Army Guard. Um, so much so that in, in fiscal 23, uh, we uh, approved with Senator McConnell's help on the Senate side, we helped secure 
$350 million in funding uh, to the Guard to acquire and field 12 Gray Eagle drones, which is, a, I understand, a company's worth of drones. Where do we stand, General Hokanson, on uh, fulfilling the uh, orders of, the, of this committee and the Congress on the, on the drones? Congressman Rogers, first of all, we greatly appreciate the support from this committee to purchase those 12 Gray Eagles. And my understanding, we'll be getting the new aircraft off the line in 27. We're in the process right now of working with the states to identify where those aircraft will be fielded. Interestingly, we purchased 12. The Army has since changed the force structure from a company of 12 to a company of eight. And so we're looking for the opportunity to potentially get four more so we can field two companies instead of one. This really sets the precedent for us as well. With eight divisions in the National Guard, some of those key capabilities are Gray Eagles as well as attack aircraft. Um, with the decision to cancel the FARA, we are looking to put attack aircraft in all of our divisions as well as Gray Eagles in all of our divisions so that we have the same capability as our active duty divisions. So when called forward, the combatant commander can expect the same capabilities coming from a guard division as our active duty counterparts. So what's the final deadline time? Sir, so uh, later this year, we'll make the decision on the fielding of the first company, and then we'll also decide where the second unit will be going as well. And the first four will be the half of that next company going forward. I assume you have the criteria at least in some form. Yes, sir. The criteria has been given to all states. Um, they are all applying, those that are interested. And as I mentioned, later on this year is when a board consisting of leadership within the Army, the Army Guard, and also the Adjutant General will make those recommendations to the Secretary of the Army where those units will be fielded. Uh, on another topic, uh, uh, I'm a former guardsman, so I uh, understand this issue is important to all of us. Um, I'm concerned that, that they receive the benefits that they deserve. Um, it seems like for decades we've been trying to address the issue of duty status reform. Uh, our current duty status and pay and benefit system is complex, overly complex, burdensome, has resulted in uh, multiple problems. Today, the most noteworthy problem uh, is that similarly situated service members can be doing essentially the same job and receive a significantly different pay and benefit package simply based on the authority on which they were ordered to duty. Uh, help me out here. Uh, why status reform is important to our soldiers? Uh, Congressman Rogers, sir, that's a, it's a great question. And uh, since 2019, we've been working on this, and it basically streamlines 27 different duty statuses down to nine to ensure whether the person is on active duty, guard, or reserve, if they're working side by side at the same time, same location, same duties, that they're eligible for all the same benefits. And it would streamline the process significantly, but also ensure that we no longer have disparity, as I mentioned in my opening statement, um, between our service members. Do any other of the panel members wish to be heard on this uh, issue? So the Army Reserve is, is greatly supportive of duty status reform and whatever we can do to help make that uh, a success. We would appreciate that. It would help us uh, with our efficiencies of processing pay actions as well. I can tell you the Navy is uh, strongly supportive and disappointed that it's taken this long. We've talked about it for several years uh, since before 2019 in my case. We all enthusiastically support the concept. I would appreciate your direction to the Department of Defense to get it done. What's the problem? How do we solve it? Sir, it's actually uh, with OMB right now. Um, it has cleared the department, and uh, almost everyone that I know of is supportive of that. Um, I think the uh, 
the issue is getting it through OMB to, to come forward, sir. Anyone wish to be heard? Uh, that's my understanding as well. The Air Force Reserve is absolutely supportive. It's been every one of my uh, talking points at every visit to the Hill uh, in the previous two years. It's, it's about aligning and getting rid of, of the deficiencies that we currently have uh, for the multitude of statuses. It's a retention issue as well. It makes it easier for our airmen to serve if they know it's a, it's a basic one, two, three, four, so to speak, of what I get paid and what entitlements I'm due. Thank all of you for your service. Mr. Chairman, I wrote you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next, uh, Touch. Got you this time. Uh, I want to talk about the um, members of, the, of this committee are familiar with the National Guard State Partnership Program. And as you know, the Maryland National Guard. Um, works very closely and is in partnership with Estonia. And uh, I've been to Estonia on numerous times and I'm very impressed with the Estonia people working with us and they, they do a lot of good work in my opinion. Can you please share uh, how this relationship is contributing to strengthen the security of the Baltic region in the face of Russia's invasion of Ukraine as well as reassuring our ad allies in the region? And I guess, uh, General, Start with you, but uh, I know everyone won't be able to talk, so. Yes, sir, thank you for that question. And so when you look at the partnership with the Baltic nations, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, those were the first partnerships we began over 30 years ago, and obviously Maryland with Estonia. Where we really saw the power of this was in 2007 when Russia had a crippling cyber attack on Estonia, which they were unprepared for. So the Maryland Guard has worked with them ever since to establish a cyber center of excellence where we share information with each other because a lot of times they're at the leading edge of seeing some of the things coming out of Russia. Um, shortly after the invasion of unprovoked invasion of Russia into Ukraine, I traveled to the Baltics, um, to Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania to reassure not only our NATO allies but also our state partners. While I was there, it was brought to my attention that Narva, which is a city in Estonia, that Putin had mentioned that's actually a Russian city, um, even though it is in Estonia. So they were very concerned about that statement. And so we worked very closely with them on their reserve component and really changed all of our training plans to focus on preparing them for a potential invasion from Russia. Um, Estonia has been very forward looking on that and preparing their nation as best they can. And we're doing everything we can to work with them on, on those areas where they feel they need the most help. And that's a great thing for the uh, Maryland Guard, but also all of our other state partners in the region. Uh, anyone else on the panel have anything to say about that? Okay. Uh, also, um, General Hoekson, many, um, let me see, let's see, short, how much time do I have? Two minutes, okay. Uh, Broadly speaking, what advantages or disadvantages do the reserve forces have uh, to, um, with respect to the attrition of cyber specialists uh, to the private sector, especially compared to those seen by our active duty com components? Congressman, I would say uh, within the Guard, um, we have a very strong cyber capability. And the great thing is, is we offer a different um, option here. They can not only have their civilian career, but they can also continue to serve in the military. And some of, I would argue, our, our best cyber units in the country are in the National Guard and Reserves because they take their civilian skill set, they bring it to work, and what they learn at work in, the, in their guard role, they also bring to their civilian career. So both see great value added um, related to that. The other option is if folks get trained on active duty and they make the decision to get out, it gives us the opportunity to retain that experience in the Guard and Reserve so our nation continues to benefit from all the training that we have put into them at a time when uh, cyber professionals are in extremely high demand. We really have issues in Maryland because NSA is located there. So it works a different way because there's a lot of personnel there. I yield back. And uh, from the Air Force Reserve, if I could, sir, uh, from our perspective, what we're particularly proud of is our cyber force retention right now is on the order of 86 percent. So we are actually retaining these uh, cyber professionals. And I think it's through uh, innovative things that we've done, like a direct commissioning source. 
So we're, we're able to direct commission enlisted and folks off the street who have the necessary requirements to make those positions. In addition to that, we have constructive credit, uh, which we're allowing people to take from the civilian community and bring it forth and, and allow them to continue to work in a military capacity on the weekend. I think this is what's allowing us to keep this elite talent that's working out there in the civilian sector and allow them to be citizen airmen at the same time. Good to hear. Anyone? Sir, if I could, with the Marines, Mar 4 Cyber there right at Fort Meade. Uh, we have what we call an individual mobilization augmentee unit. I'm a debt there that captures the talent that leaves, potentially leaves um, Mar 4 Cyber from the active component. Quick example of that is that we have a 6th Com Battalion on the East Coast, and while uh, certainly not directly involved in the countries of the Ukraine, they worked cyber with state partnership program in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador to really, you know, show our influence in that region and uh, countering uh, some of the narrative that they're getting from Russia. Okay, Thank you. That's a good question, uh, Dutch. I, I think with Estonia especially, their proximity to St. Petersburg and most of the cyber operations from Russia being ran out of St. Petersburg, the old headquarters of the KGB and their training operations. but. Uh, the Russians are very capable, unfortunately, as when it comes to cyber. Uh, Mr. Carter, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to each of you warriors. We're proud of each and every one of you. We're very proud of our Guard and Reserve, and we want to make sure that you are treated equally. Uh, General Daniels, I'll ask to talk to you, and each of you might want to talk about this. Based on the most recent Army force structure design, the reserve component will take a larger role in providing support, especially in areas of logistics and engineering. We know that in the case of large-scale combat, effective integration between reserve and Army components is critical. Does the reserve component have the resources necessary to take on this increased responsibility particularly in the, the area of sustainment. And how is the reserve component integrating with the active component, component during training cycles to build cohesive and deployable teams? So thank you very, <coughs> excuse me, thank you very much for the question. We, we, the Army, just had a very large summit within the last couple of weeks looking at 2030 and 2040 and our future uh, requirements. And so one of the, the uh, requirements that was placed back onto the Army Reserve to do a pilot or series of pilots looking at forward stationing some of our equipment for some of our logistics, engineering, and other kinds of capabilities, in, particularly the indo pacom and UCOM areas. See if we could station that equipment forward, use it for exercises, work with our counterparts in those different areas, and then maintain it um, when we're not using it. And so we're looking at the, when we forward station this equipment, it will then require us to be interoperable with the other forces and work with our partner nations. So for us, this is a great opportunity to, to explore some, some new relationships. The, uh, the, the ability to train together, uh, from what my, I understand, is critical, especially in, in the big fights. You've got to be part of one team working together I don't know whether everybody goes to the National, National Training Center or not, but if, if that's where they train, uh, do you get the opportunity to go with the active duty people and have the funds within which to do that on this new idea that, the, that you're going to do the logistics part? So the logistics will actually be stationed out within the areas, in, within the combatant commands. Okay. However, uh, the Army Reserve does support every single CTC rotation and every single warfighter with some of our capabilities. So we are actively participating and we are actually looking to link a CTC rotation with one of the Army Reserve's large exercises called a CSTX. We're looking to do those simultaneously next summer to further um, expound on using our logistics capabilities to make sure that they're being really tested and pushed to their limit to make sure that they work as, as they're going to be needed. Thank you. Any other comment from anybody else? I'd like to comment also about the importance of what we refer to as contested logistics and the Navy Reserve's uh, complete integration into the Navy and Joint Force operational plans. But we talk about uh, multiple R's, refuel, revive for medical, uh, resupply, um, and 
every, every one of the capabilities is reflected in our force design. You're very familiar with my opening statement about KC-130 Juliet. That's a part of the intra-theater lift capability. But also, if you're tracking, we're, we're shooting a lot of missiles in the Red Sea, and we used to have to drive them back through the Suez Canal to row to Spain, but now we've got expeditionary vertical launch reload teams. That's a largely reserved capability, so our sailors are doing that in real time in the Red Sea as well. So those investments from prior years are, are paying benefits today, but we continue to invest in the capacity so we can do more of it in more places. Good. Congressman Carter, if I get it from the, from the Army Guard side as well, with eight full divisions, our logistics is fully integrated into our divisions. And when we go to the National Training Center or the Joint Readiness Training Center, we send our logistics packages with them so they train exactly as they would fight. On the Air Guard side, as I mentioned, uh, we had a lot of volunteers in our C-17 and other aircraft when we logistically had to surge um, weapon systems overseas. And we continue to rely on volunteers and with our Air Guardsmen to make sure we can fill that gap and get munitions where they need to be in a timely manner. Well, I'll tell you, I'll wait for the next round. Okay, Judge, Mr. Case. Uh, thank you, um, and to all of you, thank you so much for your service, and, and General Hokanson, um, a special mahalo to you from our Hawaii uh, Army and Air Guard. You've always been an incredible partner of of our Hawaii Guard, uh, and we're you know really proud of them and grateful for them, not only for the deployments overseas, but uh, for some really key emergencies um, in Hawaii proper, not to, uh, to include COVID, Red Hill, most recently the Maui wildfires, and you've been fully supportive minutes, of all of that. So. Thank you very much from us. Um, I, I feel like I have to channel our, our absent uh, friend, uh, Mr. Womack, in, in joining in support of the State Partnership Program because he's your biggest fan, um, and you've already heard mention of that. I just want to add to that. Um, I was uh, with uh, five of our House colleagues um, uh, last week um, in the South Pacific in uh, Fiji and Tonga, and uh, they have uh, state partnership programs with Nevada. And um, it is truly amazing what an impact that partnership program has in terms of the overall relationship with those key countries. Um, we met with the senior leadership of those countries. Um, they are well aware of the partnership program. They value it, um, and it means a lot to them. So, th you know, this is something that I don't think we can overinvest in. Um, I just want to follow up on my, on my colleagues' questions on um, the Space Force, because frankly, this is kind of a puzzle to me. Um, I'm going to put this in layman's terms, um, or at least my terms, whether it's layman or not. We have a Space Force. We're trying to turn the Space Force into a full partner in the armed services. Uh, to do that, the Space Force, it seems to me, needs some form of a guard slash reserve um, construct. The Space Force has come up with their own construct that they believe works for them, which is a Space Force component, which is really a full-time, part-time uh, component. Um, somehow that has to be staffed. Um, that has to be fully staffed out for it to really be an effective uh, component. Um, the most um, direct place to get that from um, is um, the air um, guard and I suppose reserve to some extent. Um, that is being resisted uh, for various reasons which I can appreciate. Um, the response uh, to that uh, was the uh, Secretary of the Air Force uh, legislative proposal, which engendered a strong response from the, uh, you know, you um, all, and um, also from our governors over precedent, and also the fear um, expressed and implied that um, if this was forced upon um, space-related Guard and Reserve units out there, that they would leave the service rather than go to the Space Force. I frankly don't know whether that's true or not, but it's certainly an expressed uh, term. So it seems to me that we obviously haven't found the right answer yet. But one, one question that I think it does beg is that if the uh, Secretary of the Air Force's uh, proposal uh, to essentially require the transfer um, is, is not adopted, how does the Space Force <clears throat> effectively um, staff out its proposed component. Um, and will that really do 
um, uh, particular damage to, for example, um, the Air National Guard. I mean, these are space missions. In a time of mobilization, they would probably be mobilized to the Space Force, so why shouldn't they get into that channel right now? So um, these are just, you know, I'm just trying to sort this through in my mind. I don't think any of us has come up with a particularly good answer. I value, I signed the letter uh, that supported our governors because I value their, their NR adjutant general, because I value their input on, on um, a, a fear of demobilizing their own existing um, air guard. Um, and because I'm also concerned about the precedent, but I don't think anybody's answered the basic question. Um, Congressman Case, I thank you for the opportunity to, to address this. And as I've been very clear in all of my testimony since I became the chief, um, I feel the best option is just basically no cost to our nation. Our Air Guardsmen are currently serving space missions. If they want to be in the Space Force, we could just change their name tape. They would still be in the National Guard. They would still have their same civilian jobs, same location, same mission. All we do is change the signs in their name tape. Uh, the concerns that we have, and our Guardsmen have expressed this, and this is coming directly from the Space Force, is they don't even have in place the admin processes for a part-time force to manage them. Retirements, pay, benefits, any of that doesn't exist. So they're going to have to create that bureaucracy. We already have it and we've had it and it runs our Air Guard and we've effectively continued to perform our mission to include 11 overseas deployments since the Space Force was established. And they continue to do that as Guardsmen in the Air National Guard. And when you look forward, we've asked them very closely because we are concerned. Um, space capabilities are very critical to our nation right now. And when you look at the National Guard, we're actually units with equipment that perform missions. And we're not usually fillers or anything like that. And so when you look at the role that the Space Force is looking for their part-time force, they don't see them in operational units anymore. They see them in admin, educational, and institutional or test units or in staff positions. And that's really not what we do right now. And at the end of the day, whatever decision is made, it's my responsibility to make sure we continue to provide the absolute best cap space capability we can right now, and we do that. Um, we've got another deployment scheduled very shortly. Our folks continue to do their mission, um, but many of them, and up to 70%, said, look, I'm going to stay in the National Guard. And my promise to them is I will find a position for them in the National Guard if they do not want to go into the Space Force if they're forced to do so. Okay, so if we I solved for the basic lack of uh, comparable... Uh, you know, uh, benefit packages that you you say that they're concerned about. How much of the problem does that solve? Um, do, you, do you think in that case um, that if they were given a voluntary choice about whether to stay in the current guard or transfer over to the Space Force side of things, would they take that? Because somehow we have to do this. And and that's the basic challenge here. If it, If it's if it doesn't happen on a, on, a, on a smooth, voluntary basis, then somehow we have to make it happen. If we can get that answer back for the record for uh, Mr. Case, that would, that would be great. That, uh, Mr. Fleischman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, want to thank each and every one on the dais and uh, for your respective service to your great branches and collectively to our country, both officers and enlisted. Thank you very much. Uh, small point of privilege, um, Chattanooga, my hometown, is the venue of the nation's longest serving, uh, lasting, uninterrupted 75 years armed forces parade. Um, I spoke with uh, the defense secretary at our last hearing, and he was kind enough to give us General Mingus and I think Admiral Spivey to come and honor the men and women of Chattanooga. Uninterrupted, inclement weather, COVID, you name it, we are the most patriotic city in America. So. A heartfelt thank you um, to you all. Uh, I have a question on force readiness, uh, prioritization of readiness. We all recognize the ongoing challenges reinforcing NATO's eastern flank, deterring and responding to further aggression by Iran and its proxies across the Middle East, and last and most serious, the threat posed in the Western Pacific. Since the Cold War, we have more than halved the total force without an equivalent reduction in responsibilities. That seems increasingly untenable in today's environment as our relative military advantage declines. I already had concerns about the readiness levels across the force.
from the regular deployment cycles, often of guard and reserve units, before these crises in Europe and in the Middle East. I very much appreciate the importance of demonstrating presence to both deter adversaries and reassure allies and partners, but I worry about the costs of this posture on our ability to then sustain forces in the event of a major war. My question for all of you all is, could you please briefly comment on the demands of the ongoing crises and deployments on readiness and potential impacts that might have on force generation in the event of a major war? And I thank you. Uh, most recently with the Levant operations, we saw a significant increase in the requirements for, mobiliz uh, for mobility aircraft, air refueling to go over to CENTCOM. Uh, I think what we do well is we prepare our, our crews and our aircraft to be able to respond to those things. Each of those mobilizations, this one the first time since the 80s within 72-hour call-out, uh, has benefits. It allows the active duty to continue 24-7 operations, which is what we're designed to do, is sur augment, surge, uh, if a requirement exists, a contingency exists. But it comes with a price as well. That price is a mobilization to dwell. So for the three to four months that our units were mobilized in that case, they're going to get five times that where they're not approachable and not deployable again. The purpose of which is to ensure that they have the ability to reset, uh, the ability to get the aircraft working and operable uh, that, they, that might have been overused during that time period. Uh, in the case of an all-out war, if that were to occur during that five-time mobilization reset, uh, all bets are off. Uh, in the event of all, you know, what we talk about, if there's a actual conflict with the PRC, all bets are off. We're all in, uh, and the mobilization to dwell restrictions, I would expect to be waived by the Secretary of Defense in that case. Thank you. So I'm going to take a, a slightly different tact, which is the Army Reserve has, um, our overall requirements have, have come down over time. However, um, through an authority called the uh, funded reimbursable authority. It, this is an authorization that allows um, the combatant commands and others to bring on reserve personnel, sort of recolor their money in times of a crisis, specifically for intelligence personnel only at this time. Um, we are asking the committee to take a look at expanding that authority to include cyberspace and information operations types of activities so that they can counter some of these activities um, that we see from our opponents. Um, so it's called the funded reimbursable authority. Thank you. Thank you. General. Congressman Dabin. So we've not seen a decrease at all in our operational tempo. In fact, it's kind of been about the same or gone up. On any given day, we have 24,000 guardsmen deployed supporting overseas our combatant commanders. And when we talk about the impact to readiness, we actually gain readiness when we deploy because now we have our personnel on full-time orders, training up, deploying, and they're really they're at the peak of their readiness while they're there. Where we face challenges is when we have mission sets like along the southwest border where there is no military training value and if you're not from a border state it might as well be a deployment so it does have an impact on readiness for them because they're not training on their their military skill set um, the other one i would highlight most of all is the need to have fighter squadrons we've got a 60 fighter squadron requirement with 48. we have 25 of those in the national guard and our ability to retain that capability when we're already short um, fighter pilots and maintainers will be critically important um, in the next coming years as we start to modernize our fleet. Thank you. In the interest of time, thank you for your answers. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank the gentleman. Ms. Kaptur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to endorse Mr. Um, uh, Rupersberger's interest in Central Europe and our state partnership programs. Ohio's partnered with Hungary and Serbia. Uh, I guess we haven't done that good a job, uh, but I know our soldiers have. Um, so I just wanted to put that on the record. I think it'd be great to learn more about all these Central European um, partnership efforts. Um, we all come from different parts of the country, generals and admiral, and I'm from up uh, by the longest coastline in America, the Great Lakes. Um, we're heavy industrial and agricultural, and uh, we have, uh, just in my district, five units that are guard and reserve. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you some questions. Oh, and uh, General Anderson, I began my Sunday, 7 a.m., uh, at a Marine landing in Toledo, Ohio. And the people came from all across the state, and even, I don't know how the Michiganders got in, but they got in. 
they had a great time. And uh, so there's great esprit de corps in our part of the country toward the core uh, and, all, and all services. But that one is particularly memorable. They really had a good time. Um, my questions involve recruitment and workforce development. And um, I wanted to ask the questions and then you can answer. Uh, General uh, Daniels, I represent a 983rd um, engineering battalion, all kinds of trucks, all kinds of equipment, uh, no connection to our local school system in terms of uh, recruitment and gaining skills in essential um, tasks as mechanics, as um, maintainers, as uh, drivers. Um, I thought about that a great deal of the time. Maybe the department has some programs I'm unaware of, but the connection is very loose if it exists at all. Um, the, uh, in terms of um, the uh, uh, General uh, Hokanson, if I got that right, uh, um, the, um, on the medical front, we have a, we were hoping to get a guard medical unit next to our medical university. They sent us an MP unit. Uh, you know, we do our best, and uh, but I worry about medical backup and theater, and I think we could do a whole lot better in Ohio by our guard paying attention to medical units, which doesn't appear to be happening in my region anyway. And I'm wondering what the criteria is that the guard uses to establish medical facilities and stations for medical units and the training that has to go with them. Um, and uh, thirdly, in terms of Air Force, uh, we have an F-16 um, Army Guard uh, air wing in our area. We're very proud of them. I'm concerned about what's going to happen to them uh, with this Space Force uh, proposal. And we've worked for almost half a century to build it into a real base, and it is. We, we competed for F-35s, and I'm angry to this day we didn't get them because we weren't close enough to, they told us, a training base. Huh, that's interesting. Uh, but we've got Northern Command, Northern Watch. That's part of their duty station. That's part of their duty, and uh, they do a, they do a great job, by the way. So those are kind of my uh, first round questions. Yes, uh, Congresswoman. Um, with respect to the medical units, um, all of ours are part of the uh, the total army, and so when in our divisions, we look at the force structure we're authorized, and then we work with the adjutants general to determine the best locations for those. Um, I'll follow up with General Harris Thank on you. the interest within the state. Um, with respect to the, uh, the fighter aircraft and the F-16s and, and obviously the space units in Ohio, obviously our number one priority is our people. Uh, we want to keep them and retain them as best we can. And so we're working hopefully to, to get a resolution for what our space professionals will do. Uh, but obviously the, um, when we look at the F-16, it's a great unit. And we look forward to continuing to modernize them in the F-16 and hopefully look for a future aircraft. Um, with just one touch on the recruiting, you mentioned access to the schools. We're actually doing a pilot program right now with the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association because within the reserve component in the active, we run a star-based program where we teach STEM primarily in middle schools. Um, AOPA and the Experimental Aircraft Association also do that at the high school level. And so we're trying to develop a connectivity to encourage kids to, produce, um, to pursue STEM degrees and STEM, but then also connect them to the local guard and reserve and active organizations there to show them potential careers in aviation. Mr. Chairman, I would really appreciate for the record each of you summarizing whatever connectivity programs you have to our younger people that connect service and workforce development. I'm really, really interested in that. And you know what? Working with the Department of Defense on that issue is misery. Just trying to figure out what they're doing, where they're doing. And um, uh, thank you very, very much again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, General Lady. Uh, Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> thank you, ladies and gentlemen, in the front and back row for your service to our country. Uh, Lieutenant General Daniels, according to a recent report on the Army shortage of psychological operations soldiers, I understand that 83% of the Army psychological operations soldiers are in the Army Reserve. How can we help ensure that the Army leverages those unique skill sets uniquely in the Army Reserve, and how does their position in the Army Reserve impact the overall Army's overall psychological operations mission? 
So one of the um, initiatives that, that we've taken on this past year is to look at those programs, um, those skill sets, civilian acquired skill sets that can be brought onto active duty, brought into the Army Reserve, brought into the Guard that don't require, we will accept the credentialing from the civilian agencies so they don't have to go through training again. So the Army Reserve had, um, of the 44 that the active component was accepting, the Army Reserve only had seven. We are now up to that full complement of capabilities so they spend less time doing training and are back at their employers. So we're trying to minimize that time away from work and that time away from their, their, from their, um, from their hometowns in order to conduct Army training. We're looking to further increase our direct commissioning, uh, improve that process. It's been taking about 18 months. We're trying to get it down to about nine months. Um, that will be a piece of the Army, the, the new Army um, Recruiting Command. They're taking a look at, at how they can integrate that and have a single point of entry so we can again bring those civilian acquired skills um, into the reserve and then help keep them there. Uh, Lieutenant General Healy, the uh, FY25 budget shows a significant cut to flying hours for the Air Reserve, which is a nearly uh, $160 million reduction. How does this budget request ensure maximum readiness for reservists as we continue to see pilot shortages across the Air Force? I appreciate the, uh, the question. The, the flying hour cut uh, that we're looking at in 25 is 16,000. That's, it could be as much as 10,000 below a 76,000 flying hour budget that we require in order to be, to meet our readiness needs. But based on the current contingency flying that we're doing, uh, a different pot of money, TWICF, Transportation Working Capital Fund, which gets after con contingency operations. If the, uh, if the amount of contingency flying, specifically for CENTCOM and the Levant operations, continues, we are able to get uh, that deficit made up with those TWICF hours. If it flatlines a little bit and there's not as much contingency in 25, the expectation is that we would come back for a roughly 10,000 hour bump up, specifically for our C-5 and our C-17 flying hour operations. Seeing that I have a, a little more time and uh, following up on uh, some questions from the chair, the ranking member, and uh, Mr. Case. Uh, General, were you at all uh, given the opportunity to advance your concerns? And uh, uh, how do you think the rank and file have accepted this uh, reallocation of Space Force? Congressman Joyce, uh, we have been involved in the process. Um, obviously, there's uh, the legislative proposal that we're, we discussed earlier about uh, where the governors have all signed letters um, towards that. Um, the committee has, over the course of the years, has asked for, I think, six studies, and none of them, have, only one has made them over here. Um, there's currently another uh, proposal right now, a 924 report that's going through the process. Um, so we are involved in that. We have our, our folks there. When it comes down to the rank and file, um, about 70% say they want to stay in the Guard. Um, in fact, would even go to doing a different job in the Guard. And right now, our, frankly, our country can't afford to lose that level of experience in the space field. Our units have been doing this for almost 30 years. Some are extremely good, I would argue, some of the best at what they do. And so for me, I'm trying to retain that capability in our nation because we absolutely need it. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Elsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to see you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, I haven't seen this many stars since I did my last unsuccessful flyby. And, uh, but I will say that I'm truly afraid of the uh, senior enlisted advisors behind them who have probably 8,000 years of experience, combat time, and, and thank you all for all being here, in, in, including the folks in the back. General Huck Hansen, you are the right guy for your job. Class of 86 at, at West Point, I'm sorry, but you did go to the PG school and the Navy War College to get to where you are today, so I'm, I'm glad to see that. Uh, General Daniels, this incredible resume, and especially for, for all of your background, you're the perfect person for the job, empirical data in, in a time in which the money doesn't seem to exist, neither do the resources. General Healy, your career in tankers and logistics is going to be extremely important if the balloon goes up by 2027. You're the perfect guy for the job. And then Lonnie Anderson, I'm sorry, General Anderson. It's on his bio, but it's kind of glossed over. Blue Angel right there. And he flew with my friend Jerry Darren, who says to give you a hard time, which I'm not going to do yet. And then Admiral Mustin, it's good to see you. I've known him for a long time. We have the most 
incredible group of folks with corporate knowledge for the Guard and Reserves that I've ever seen assembled in one place, which I think is timely based on what we're talking about in a world environment that looks very much like 1940. For my limited time, I'm going to go ahead and address Admiral Mustin, and let's talk about the unsexy stuff that we do, logistics, tanking, things that we're going to need after day one. The war games talk about day one. What about day two? Contested logistics in Indo-PACOM is an extremely important thing, and now that we're looking at, 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 a, at a perhaps wider war in Europe, all of these things come to a very, uh, a very important peak that you're all going to be needed for. So let's talk about C-130Js. The Navy's unfunded priority list in, includes a KC-130J, which is a great picture of a KC-130T tanking a H-53K carrying an F-35 that came out this week all three integral pieces of, of our war fighting capability. So that aircraft is important for intra-theater lift requirement, especially for Indo-PACOM, for PAPI, where the U.S. faces a tyranny of distance. Our goal is to replace the T with the J by 2030. Can you detail the Navy's need for, for everybody, why we need the 130J? Absolutely. Well, Congressman, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, and, you know, my opening statement, heavily emphasize the need for the transition from the Tango to the Juliet variant. Um, so starting from requirements, my requirement is validated at 32 airframes. That's predicated on a 75% mission capable rate, really 24 airframes. Again, and that, that is a minimum number when you talk about Admiral Paparo and now Admiral Kaler. I would tell you they're going to say that that number is about three times that number. But, um, but as it relates to today, we're looking at a need for 24 operational airframes. Flying the Tango, for, which for me averages per airframe at about 31 years, means that I'm struggling to maintain about nine airplanes that are mission capable on a daily basis. Now, keep in mind, not just for Indo-PACOM, but around the world, I've got enduring detachments where we're flying these. Most recently in CENTCOM, where the request came in for my detachment to double the amount of C-130s that were on station. Uh, so, the, so the reality is the demand for them is persistent and real, and, and the scale will only increase. Back to how we're going to get there. Originally, my, my boss at the time, the Chief of Naval Operations, Mike Gilday, uh, tasked me to recapitalize by 2030. So it's 32 airframes by 2030. Uh, we predicated a plan from 2025 to 2030, six airframe, airframes per year, and, and now we're just at the point where we're beginning to realize with the first, thank you all very much, in 2024, but ultimately what's going to happen is we're probably going to need to increase that number per year. Next okay. year, for instance, I'll need nine to get us back on glide slope to get there. Well, that answered my question. I'm going to give back the reserve of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Hope for a second round. Hey, Congressman, if I, sir, if I could just add one thing to that. Go ahead. Um, you bring up a great point. So we talk about capability, but we don't talk enough about capacity. And it's the depth that the reserve component provides. And one of the recent RAND studies commissioned by the Air Force, it took just to the F-16. And they realized in the reserve component, it costs 42% less to operate an F-16. And in fact, 34% um, less for our KC-135s. And when we look at the amount of aerial refueling capability we have in the reserve component, we have to make sure we keep that capacity. Thanks. Thank you, General. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Apologize for being late. We had the, the NASA Administrator in the other room. So uh, I want to thank you guys for your service, uh, your continued service, and uh, um, your leadership in the Reserves. Uh, I have had the pleasure of being in the Reserves for three years myself, and then I realized I was the most dangerous guy in the sky and decided to grow up and get a real job. Uh, which was not this one, uh, by the way. Um, so uh, I want to thank you. We passed a piece of legislation uh, back in uh, December of 2022 that was actually signed into law by the president in January of 2023 on the active duty side called the Military Spouse uh, Licensing Relief Act. Uh, it is now the law of land, and it's actually helped a couple hundred thousand uh, family members on active duty where it allows uh, the spouses to... Um, basically cross-deck their professional licenses across state lines. So if they were a teacher, a nurse, a doctor, a real estate agent, whatever it is, uh, they when they got orders, when their spouse got orders from one state to the next, they didn't have to get recertified and they didn't have to, get, to pay the money and get recredentialed to go in front of a board. Sometimes that takes 
over a year, a couple thousand dollars, it's cost prohibitive, time prohibitive, and they didn't do it. So you've, now you got an active duty family going down to single in, single income for two to three years, wherever they're based. Um, that that is now law land on the active duty side. I've got a, a mission now, and a, and frankly, uh, hopefully in partnership, I've spoken with a few of, uh, of you all here already that. Uh, I would like to expand that, uh, and that's not necessarily the purview of the Appropriations Committee, uh, but I would like to expand that and, and, and enable that on the authorizing side uh, with, uh, with HASC uh, to get that to apply to the reserve side. So I think uh, in terms of quality of life, there's a lot of issues we've got going on. We've got record uh, low retention and recruitment. The pay is not where it needs to be. Uh, there's a whole lot of issues it's a multi multifaceted problem but i think getting that dual income allowing the spouse um to uh, be able to stay in the workforce uh but then the collateral benefit of also having that community having access to more teachers and more nurses and more doctors where in districts like mine we are short um and then having that tax revenue at the local levels the state levels and federal levels get reinjected i think it's it's a win 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 uh, if we do it right so Wanted to float that idea. That is a two-putt, you know, process. It's not something probably going to get done in FY25, but uh, we didn't think the the active duty side was going to get done in, in 2023, to be honest, and ended up getting expedited. So wanted to get your thoughts on that. If you're hearing that feedback on the guard side, on the reserve side, and then, um, you know, can we get your support on something like that for to get some pull from the, from the leadership, um, especially uh, affecting our our junior enlisted and mid mid enlisted senior enlisted ranks as well but uh i'll open up to any one of you feedback on that if you've got any antibodies that or see any reason why that's a dumb idea to go run up that hill let me know but i'm going to go run up that hill otherwise congressman garcia i'll jump in my wife and i were at the recent signing for the active component and we're actually part of that process my wife was a school teacher and every time we pcs she had to go through and it would take the duration of our time that we were there and so I would be greatly supportive of this because at the end of the day, as you mentioned, it's very difficult now without two incomes for many families to make it. And anything we can do to make their service easier is going to make a huge difference for recruiting and for retention. Appreciate that, General. Uh, I see it as a cost saver. As an appropriator, we can either throw more money at pay and benefits and, and everything else, uh, or we can help with the quality of life side if we can get the local communities to pay for that second income to augment the total household income and get quality of life above the poverty line then uh, we can save american taxpayer dollars and by the way the, the like i said the government actually makes money on that when they're working and getting taxed and we get the workforce in the local community so uh that's all i have i want to thank you guys for your support i'm very uh concerned about the lack of um uh uh, frankly, assets uh, within the reserve components, especially on the Air National Guard side, to be um, that complementary force to the active duty right now. I think we've gotten below or approaching cr below critical mass on the uh, on some of the platforms that, that are being allocated to y'all. Um, and the uh, I think that's something we've got to keep looking at as appropriators to make sure that we're getting the right equipment at the right levels to the, the, the guard, to the reserve units, and making sure that... Um, Again, one plus one equals three, and you're not just seen as the as the ugly stepchild to the active duty side. So you've got that commitment. We'll keep pushing on that. Yeah, I'd certainly like to comment. That's uh, one, as I said in my opening comments, uh, uh, concurrent proportional fielding. Uh, we absolutely want to see that continue uh, with its intent, uh, so that we're able to have fifth gen aircraft participating as a surge capacity in a fifth gen fight in the future. Well said. Thank you, General, for that. And uh, with that, I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. We're going to do a lightning rod real quick because we have uh, votes coming up. So I'll start off uh, quickly. One uh, on the uh, with the March Air Reserve. I'll be a little parochial here on the, on that, General Healy. Uh, two years ago, your predecessor indicated he expected to bed down the KC-46A at March uh, by the second quarter of uh, fiscal year 25. Is that still on track? Uh, no, sir. Uh, due to production delays, uh, not of our control, the expectation is third quarter of 27 will be first aircraft arrival of 12. Okay. Well, I'll talk to our friends at Boeing. We seem to talk to them often lately. Uh, also, obviously, the, uh, General Hulkerson, the uh, Air National Guard, is dealing with a potential gap, as we talked about, in fighter jet capacity uh, as it modernizes from the F-15C to the F-15EX. Um, 
what are we doing to eliminate that gap? And I, I suspect you have some production problems there too, but uh, let's uh, answer to that one. Mr. Chairman, obviously uh, you saw on my unfunded priority list, I added uh, six uh, F-15EXs because they were cut from the Air Force by as well as six F-35s uh, to make sure that we can continue to field these units so that we don't create what we call a bathtub where we don't have enough capability at the most critical time as we face challenges from our competitors around the globe. So we're working everything we can to get those airframes as fast as we can. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to focus by talking to General Daniels. In your testimony, you talked about child care pilot program that started fourth quarter of uh, 23. It was an intergovernmental support agreement in Kansas City metropolitan area, which was offering no cost child care options during the weekend and annual training. Um, as Mr. Garcia pointed, there's a lot of things that go into recruitment and retention, both for you yourselves and for your uh, uh, full-time uh, partners. Uh, why don't you just take a minute and not only tell us that there's funds set aside in 25 for going, but what this means when we can get not only the pay right, but the health care right, the housing right, the child care supports that the families need. Thank you so much for that. Our first pilot failed gloriously. Um, we were not able to find providers, so the IGSA proved to be a, a really good venue to find sort of on-demand care. It's sort of like ordering an Uber. Um, they're vetted, they're credentialed, you know exactly what the product is that you're getting. These families are very comfortable. They're within um, a reasonable distance of where the family lives. So it's giving those soldiers a lot of relief and an ability to go and attend when they may not have been able to, they may have been challenged. So for retention purposes, this has been tremendous. We've been working with the Guard at looking at some other locations. We're looking with the Navy Reserve at some other locations to expand the program. So we're looking to build this into to future year's budgets because it is truly, it is a, a great retention tool so if you could if, if this is a lightning broad what what is the one one thing it could be child care whatever that that keeps you up at night when it comes to having people stay on or come into the reserve of the guard what, what's one quality of life issue chair McComb, i'll add health care um, we have about uh, 30,000 guardsmen that don't have health care and for me, we need them 24-7, not just for their overseas deployments, but as we know emergencies occur in a community at any time, we need them to be medically ready. And if they don't have health care or access to health care, um, then they can't be ready and then they can't perform the job that we've trained them to do. To me, it's, um, for lack of a better term, like an insurance policy on investment we've made, but also an investment that they have made. Uh, from the Air Force Reserve perspective, ma'am, you know, I would say that the access to TRICARE Reserve Select for our uh, reserve technicians and our uh, Title V civilians, that's in excess of over 10,000 of, of the folks working for us. They don't have access to TRICARE Reserve Select until 2030 is the, the wedged time frame right now. In some cases, that's doubling, tripling the cost of the, uh, the premiums for them. But what it lacks is the continuity of care. So if we have a reserve technician who is a civilian during the week on the federal employee health benefit system, and then they're perhaps on a set of orders for an extended period of time, they're having to transition back and forth between multiple uh, care providers, which pr provides a challenge. This is the force that trains our, our part-timers. It's critical to readiness, and it's certainly a retention issue and a recruiting issue for that full-time force. For the Marine Reserves, ma'am, I, I think uh, access certainly to TRICARE Reserve Select is uh, needs to continue. But just to give you a little vignette of what that looks like for a sergeant that just left active component, direct affiliated to the reserves over the uh, course of the weekend, if she is going to have TRICARE Reserve Select and pay for service men's group life insurance at the same time, when she leaves that drill weekend, she's really got about $120 in her pocket at the end of the day for, for two days of work because of the expense of TRICARE Reserve Select and, uh, and the travel to a, a, a drill site. I, I think the uh, access to health care, we've beaten that sufficiently, but I would say what keeps me awake at night is the sufficiency of the training uh, of our sailors. So uh, what we're finding right now, believe it or not, I know we like to hear in the headlines that uh, the military is struggling on recruiting and retention. I always say those are two very different things. Right now, the Navy Reserve and our selected reserve capacity is at a seven-year high for retention. So, and, and I attribute that to the quality of training. I think our sailors appreciate having a well-defined mission 
a well-defined adversary for which we can prepare, and the sense of purpose and the professionalism that is associated with it is impacting positive retention in our case. Thank you. Uh, Judge Carter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. General Hawkins said a few years ago the Texas National Guard 3D printed barracks, the first of their kind. Other state guards have used 3D printing for aircraft parts. Overall, is the guard looking at using more 3D printing? And where else would the guard like to use this technology? And what benefit could it bring to you? Yeah, Congressman Carter, thank you. I've actually been there to see the 3D printed barracks. And we did it in half the time at two thirds the cost. In fact, um, they also built a training center as well in Texas. And also, we're, as you mentioned, we're using it for 3D printed parts. We see great capability and great promise here uh, because these facilities are actually enduring, very well made. Um, but once again, we have the ability to save cost and get that facility up in a much quicker time. So we look to continue to invest in this across the 54 National Guards um, in the environments that make sense to put those facilities in. Well, I was very impressed with 3D printing and speed and the, and the solid building it builds and I hope all the, 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 the folks that are building buildings are to take a look at this. Thank you. Yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, Dutch. Thank you. Uh, General Daniels, um, you've mentioned your desire to grow and flesh out uh, your cyber brigade, uh, but that there are challenges in the training uh, pipeline for the cyber career field. Can you share some of these challenges and how you're addressing them within the Army Reserve? And if anyone else would like to uh, talk on that, feel free. So that this is a, a place where we're looking to, to try and use as much of the civilian acquired skills to receive credit on the Army side. So you don't have to do training that you could possibly even instruct. So we're trying to have those, those credits available, reduce the amount of time that, that that cyber professional is away from their civilian career, um, so minimize the training pipeline that they must go through because they already have that expertise. Go ahead and leverage that. So we've been working with the Army on not only the cyber uh, career field, but lots of other civilian acquired skills to make sure that, that the Army appreciates the training that they are, these, these soldiers, you know, citizen soldiers already come to the force with. Anyone else have a comment? Yes, sir. And very similarly, uh, but we're Where investing. Where are your stars? Uh, they're actually on my college. So oh, okay. I know you mentioned that I don't have them on my shoulder. Nobody else had stars there. there. They're, they're right there. Uh, I, I was going to. Yeah. I was going to. I was going to offer that in private, but uh, anyway, that's it. But uh, very similar to what you heard from Lieutenant General Daniels, we're investing heavily in cyber capability. We've also increased by adding a cyber rating now uh, for our enlisted sailors and a cyber designator for officers. And, and we're very interested in direct commissioning to increase the capacity across the reserve force, which we see as a growth industry. Do you ever work with the Naval Academy at all on that, this issue? A absolutely. In fact, I frequently go to Hopper Hall, which is the cyber center. I'll uh, hit on the, on the training aspect of this real quick, sir. I can have somebody flying an F-35 before they're fully qualified to operate on infrastructure as a cyber operator. So the footprint that's required, if I'm going to take somebody directly into the reserves and they're not trained, I have to come up and find that active duty time to, to train them and, oh, by the way, be away uh, from their civilian career to get to that point. So we really rely on capturing the active component talent that comes to the Marine Forces Reserve because we can't do it and train our own people. Anyone else? That's right. I would say the same with the Guard. We have 66 cyber units in 42 different states, um, and we rely very heavily on the civilian acquired skills that they bring. Um, not only that, but you'll see we also are very involved uh, to ensure election security by leveraging that. And we're in the process now of changing the way we had our, we had a cyber element in every state. We're actually building them into a, called a defensive cyber element. It's kind of like a squad so that if we need to, we can combine states to actually have cyber additional force structure to address not only on their Title X role, but also how they can help the communities and mitigate a lot of the ransomware attacks on our public schools and counties. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garcia, we only have a few minutes, so just I'll try to get everybody just real be quick. brief. First of all, I want to say it warms my cockles to hear an Army uh, four-star uh, say that he asked for six F-35s and additional F-15EXs. That's a... Uh, could some good joint operations uh, shaping you guys are doing there. Uh, General Anderson, for the, the uh, Reserve uh, F-18 Squadron, uh, VF uh, MA, I believe, 112, 
are they getting the the APG seventy nine uh, V four AESA radar upgrade down in those uh, in those jets yet, or what's the plan there? Thank you for the question, sir. We are uh, upgrading uh, the aircraft for VMFA-112 and plan on keeping them uh, in the rotation. In fact, they'll be uh, going on their next GDP here in the coming years, just like uh, we have battalions that are going forward into the first island chain. So certainly uh, for TAC Air and the Reserves, while small, right, uh, I would like to have uh, more TAC Air squadrons. Uh, but for that particular uh, component, as the F-18 community overall has, has gotten smaller in the Marine Corps, We've captured the bench in that squadron is is pretty deep. So yeah, you're getting golden golden parts in there. Uh, but it, but are you getting the AESA upgrade done? Yeah, where we are uh, getting not only the upgrade, but we certainly when you talk about parts, we have uh, yeah. we have excess capacity the excess. now as we get some more from, okay. from the West Coast. We'd love to come see that operation uh, absolutely if, if we can. So and thank likewise, you. Uh, the uh, with the Air Force Reserve, the F-16s are pre block with the oldest F-16s we've got running out there right now. We've been using in Korea very wisely, putting ESA radars in those. In the Saber, uh, North of Grumman Saber, in there. Good, awesome, great. Thank you, guys. Thank, and we'll thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. So okay. we're 22. We'll complete our buy. And as uh, John mentioned, in the pre-block F-16s, in another setting, I can tell you how successful they have been, and it's a huge investment. It's a game changer, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all. Appreciate it. I yield back. Great, uh, Ms. Captor, real quickly. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm just wondering if you could provide for me uh, each of your services um, an understanding of how workforce development and recruitment work to attract uh, enlistees. And um, the um, Army Reserve Civilian Acquired Skills Program uh, Talk to me about my 983rd unit. How does what you do impact that and impact recruitment and workforce development in that region? I have no idea. Um, mainly Reserve and Guard don't come to see us very much. Uh, active duty does more, and it's really hard to the commanding officer for that unit's in Chicago, so that creates another issue. Um, but uh, I am very interested in how each of your services connects recruitment to workforce development. If you could provide more uh, specific uh, information to the record, I would be very grateful for that. And uh, especially in the fields of mechanics, um, machine tooling, uh, truck driving, vehicular operation um, on on land, and then in the air. So if I could very briefly... If, the if Army we can get back on the record on that, I will have enough time to re recognize Mr. Aguilar before we can probably have to then go vote at that point. Mr. Aguilar. I uh, appreciate that, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to briefly... Um, ask a question, and maybe it, it can be for the record, uh, to highlight the National Guard's state partnership program. Uh, this is something uh, Chairman Calvert uh, has discussed time and time again, uh, to highlight the partnership that California has uh, with Ukraine, uh, and it proved invaluable, is an invaluable resource for our ally uh, in this war against Putin's aggression. And that partnership is a strong example of a proactive military-to-military -military relationship, as, as you all know. I was pleased to see the increase in funding for the state partnership program in the FY25 request. Um, uh, so I wanted to ask about insight as to um, how this increase will support the SSP program this year, including a support for new partner nations uh, as well. Congressman, if I could just touch this briefly. Um, we've really leveraged... Russia's invasion of Ukraine to, in fact, we've actually took, spoken with a lot of former neutral countries. Sweden and Finland obviously became NATO allies. They also became members of the state partnership program. Switzerland recently submitted an application to be a state partner. We've also talked to other neutral countries yet to be named, but they have all expressed an interest that they need to develop a capability based on what they saw. No one thought there'd be another war in Europe. There is now, and they realize that capability that they need. We were able to add seven countries this year, um, which is the most we have really since we started, um, because they realized the benefit that they can get by training with our guardsmen up to a high level of standard and addressing those shortages they have in their military. I think California's expressed interest in that uh, Sweden uh, relationship as, as well. I appreciate, appreciate the answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. We all want to go to Switzerland and check out the program. Uh, 
Uh, all we need is more money for these state programs, so uh, hopefully we can get through this budget process. I appreciate uh, everyone coming out today. Before we conclude, I want to thank our witnesses, their testimony today. Um, Ms. McCollum, you have any uh, comments you want to make? Just once again to the folks who are, this is the last time before the committee, sincerely not only to thank you, but thank your family members who supported you in your journey. Thank you. And Mr. Elsie, I know you had a quick remark to make, so. I did. Thank you, sir. Uh, the definition of reserves is a military force withheld from action for later decisive use. And that's what the reserves are. The reserves mean if we attrite in war, we send in the reserves, both the aircraft, the maintenance, everything that they need. That's the reserves. We don't have enough. The Chinese know that we got KC-46 delays. The K Chinese know that we're closing the F-18 line. The Chinese know we don't have any more capacity for F-35s. So as we look at these line closings imminently and the inability to res send reserves, we can't send reserve F-16s to augment the loss of an aircraft carrier and its F-18s. We need to keep those lines open because the Chinese know the tanking capacity, the ability to, to infill our lines with what we are going to lose, whether it's in Europe, UCOM, or Indo-PACOM, and we need more. And as you said, all it takes is money. However, we need to keep those lines open because they're watching. Thank you. I, I, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We'll go to the other 11 committees.